Church family, it's Pastor Kyle. And over this past year, so much has changed in the world and at our church. But one thing that hasn't changed in Mount Ruvidome is our commitment to the youth. And right now, we're looking for volunteers to help serve teaching Sabbath school, in our Pathfinders, in our outreach ministry, and just the youth department overall. So if you're interested in serving in any of those capacities, or if you would just like to learn a little bit more about what we're doing, please feel free to contact me. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I am so excited today. You know why? Because of you. Mount Rubido, Maine, Mount Rubido, Moreno Valley, and Ruby Nation. Welcome to this blessed Sabbath that God has granted us the opportunity to be a part of, where we can come to love, grow, and serve. This morning as we come, I am reflecting on last week how we celebrated our mothers. It was a beautiful time. We had ruby chicken and waffles. Uh, for those of you who are thinking in your heart, no animals were harmed during this event. It was all vegetarian. But what was more important is the way we were able to let our mothers know that we appreciate them. And they were delighted to be served by the men. Literally, they sat in their cars and we walked up as, as, as concierges and butlers and waiters and handed them their food with the utensils and something delectable to wash it down with. We pray by the grace of God as mothers that you know we love you and that we appreciate you because it is mother's hands that rock the cradle. So once again, happy Mother's Day, which I think is every day. You know, as I was looking at it, for you men out there, I want to tell you, my wife really helped me out for Mother's Day. My wife came up to me, we've been married 37 years, and she shared with me, hey, by the way, you made reservations for Mother's Day at Ruth Chris. What could I say? I'm just glad that she knows my mind because that's exactly where I would have taken her. Well, I told her she's messed up women across the world, messed up husbands, I should say, because next year, husbands, I'm warning you, your wife is probably going to let you know what you reserved for her or bought for her. So, hey, since my wife did it, I just want to mess, make sure I mess up some other men also. But once again, happy Mother's Day. I have been enjoying having the parking lot worship. And it's been something that we have seen how God has brought us together as a church. Uh, even though we have sat in our cars, even though we have to worship through the honking of horns, uh, God has blessed us. I want you to know that this week and the following two weeks will be the last weeks of the formal parking lot ministry. We're going to take a hiatus for June to give the praise team, the audio team, and others, the deacons, uh, and others who have been working hard all throughout this pandemic an opportunity to refresh as well as go into the sanctuary and make sure that the sanctuary is prepared for our re-entry. So come out and enjoy these last uh, three weeks, which is today and the next two weeks. Uh, come out and enjoy with us. Let's pack that parking lot as we celebrate what God has done bringing us through this pandemic. I know that face masks are being removed, and I think we ought to come out and just thank God that we've been able to survive and able to get back to some form of normalcy. Uh, I want you to know that we are still having vaccinations. If you go onto our sites, you'll be aware that we have two more dates that are there for vaccination at Mount Rubido. Tell your friends or loved ones who would like to have it 
uh, that we are having those vaccinations. I think it is Pfizer uh, at our church. I also want to say that when we come to July, July is just going to be exciting. On July the 3rd, we're going to have Appreciation Sabbath Part 1, where we want to show appreciation to you as members who have diligently been engaged in ministry and helping us as a church, uh, both online and offline. And so we're going to celebrate that, but remember, that Sabbath is going to be in the gym. We're going to come inside and we're going to do like a precursor to re-entry into the sanctuary. We don't want to re-enter into the sanctuary until we do so with our new pastor, Pastor Alfonso Green III and his family. And so the first two Sabbaths, the first one will be Appreciation Sabbath Part 1. We want you to come out where we are able to show appreciation to you and you're able to show appreciation to one another. Then the second Sabbath, which would be Appreciation Sabbath Part 2, we're going to have appreciation and communion. We believe it is important before the new pastor comes that we as brothers and sisters come together and, and make sure that things are right with us so that we will be prepared for our leader who's coming to be able to continue to take us forward as we love, grow, and serve. I also have to go back and let you know on the first Sabbath, we also are going to have a memorial uh, video or uh, collage of our family and loved ones that we lost during this COVID period. And so if you have a loved one who uh, you lost during this period of time, family members uh, that you lost during this period of time, um, then we want you to connect with Sister Esther or uh, Sister Alexander and the elders uh, to let them know. Uh, we would love to include uh, your family uh, if they were a part of Mount Rubido uh, and we lost members, then we want that information. So please uh, bear that in mind. I want to thank you and say congratulations to all of you from uh, January all the way up to this date um, in, in May that has had a birthday all of the April and backwards. We want to say happy birthday as well as to all of the anniversaries. Those of you who have survived marriage during COVID where you were forced to spend time with your mate. I pray that it was exciting as mine is I delight spending time with Denise. And we have spent quite a bit of time doing uh, COVID, especially driving around headed nowhere. <laughs> Just get in the car and drive. Uh, but it gives us a time to spend time with each other. So once again, we welcome you to this Sabbath. May God bless you as we continue to worship him in spirit and in truth. You've heard it said so many times that prayer is the breath of the soul. It means that when we don't pray, we don't breathe. And so we've come to that time where we want to breathe. We want to pray. We want to spend a moment with God and ask him to, first of all, accept our praise. We want to say, thank God for how good he's been to us. Then we want to breathe in behalf of others, asking God to answer prayers of healing, prayers of finances, prayers of jobs, prayers of family, prayers for our children, prayers for our mates, even prayers for this world, because there's a lot going on. Folk, we're living in the last days, and these signs are nothing but a fulfillment of what we have been reading about for so many years. But it's sneaking up on many of us because I think we have put the pages down and ceased reading the news in conjunction with the Bible. But if you are doing it, then we want to pray for these last days, the events that are ushering in the end of time. 
Today, though, I want to focus on a young man named Colvin. We've been praying for Colvin. And I really need you to call on God in his behalf. We want things to get better for Colvin. He's a young man who should have so much of life ahead of him. But the enemy of sickness wants to rob him of that. But I believe that the God of healing is able to override sickness. And so if you, by faith, will reach out with me and say, God, heal Colvin. Of course, we say, not our will, but your will be done. But we also claim where he said, where two or three claim something, then we ask that God respond. I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray. God, of our weary years, this is one of those times when we are weary for a young man who deserves to live, who deserves to experience life with his parents, with his friends, with his family, deserves to experience life on a skateboard or bicycle, or walk in the park or swim in the ocean. I pray, God, that if it's your will, that you will perform a miracle for Colvin and his family. There's nothing too hard for you to do. I know we cannot be in your mind and we may not know everything, but one thing we do know, you love Colvin. One thing we do know is that you have the ability to heal. One thing we do know, you hear a parent's cry. But I know that ultimately we have to do so within your will. I pray that our desire and your will intersect in the life of Colvin, in his body. We are touching his body by faith. We're touching it, asking the Holy Spirit to run through his body, to run through his mind, and by the grace of God to heal him. We not only pray for him and his healing, but for others who have prayer requests of financial healing, of job healing, of emotional healing, mental healing, social healing. Whatever that case may be, today we ask that you heal. And as we come and approach the Word of God, may it be a healing message. You know we've been deconstructing the church, not destroying the church, but taking a look at it to analyze it, that it may fulfill your original purpose. So God, heal our church. Heal us as church members individually. Heal us collectively, that we may be healers for our community. So bless us throughout the remainder of this worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the history of church, one of the things that we have watched is how God can do so much with so little. But then we turn around and we see God can do even much more with much. I remember in the Old Testament when God turned around and took up an offering for the sanctuary. It overflowed so much till the prophet had to tell them to stop. I would love for Rubido to experience a stop moment, meaning that so much is given and the needs are met so overwhelmingly that we could literally say stop. But you know what? The only way we can get to the point where we say stop is if you start. You gotta give. You start giving and you can build to the point of stop. You start giving when you return your tithe unto the Lord to help with the work. You start by giving an offering, which helps with the overall ministry and maintenance of the church. It is time that we put forth an effort to get a stop giving move. 
Not stop giving because you're upset or stop giving because uh, we haven't been in church. We're talking about a stop giving because so much giving is coming in. So many people are benefiting both in the church and outside the church from what we give that the Lord has to say, you can stop. So today, today's offering is a start so you can stop offering. Let us bow our heads and pray. God, we can never get to a stop giving moment unless we start giving. And so today, in behalf of you as the head of the church, in behalf of the order that you've given that we give by returning of tithe and the giving of offering, we start. We start, we give thee but thine own, whatever it may be. All that we have is thine, O Lord, a trust from thee. So bless our start offering, our start giving. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Cornerstone um, is something that... Uh, you just have to have, you have to um, submit to because it's, it's just life, it's how you survive. Without it, you're, you're breakable, you're, you know, you're, you're destined to just fail um, and to fill every part of what sin has to offer to you without corner, that cornerstone that Jesus gave us on the cross.
So I will trust in the rock. I will trust in the rock. I will trust in the rock. Jesus. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're back as we continue to peruse the subject, deconstructing church. As we stated, deconstructing church means analyzing it, taking a look at it to see what the Bible's intended purpose, what was Christ's intended purpose for the church. The reason why this has become so important was, as I stated, because of the pandemic, we had gotten in sort of a lackadaisical state. Now, during the pandemic, it was very important that we still gather together, which I share with you that you can gather together as um, two people or as a small group or even congregationally. But the problem with the pandemic, it put us in a state of mind that we got used to being able to have church while in our pajamas, while we're texting, while we're emailing, while we're even talking to somebody else with two screens beside each other, looking at different services or even the news or sports or whatever the case may be. And we got to the point where we began to say that we don't necessarily think that congregating together, going back to church, is even important. 
But yet we discovered in the Word of God that God had already addressed this issue of indifference where he stated that, listen, I have provided a new way. I've torn the curtain. I'm here for you. You can approach me boldly. But I want you to not forsake coming together considering all that I've done for you. It ought to give you confidence and, and boldness. But you need to get together to spur each other, to push each other, to thrive towards loving each other and reaching out. So assembling together goes beyond my own personal desire, but it helps me in my personal need because when we come together, we can encourage and spur each other on. When I'm down, you can build me up. When you're down, I can build you up. We can also then encourage each other to go out and share this great faith. We talked about indifference. Then we talked about individualism. We talked about how it's not about you. It's about us. It's about gathering together and going forth to make a difference in the world. We're talking about legacy, leaving a legacy, not living unto yourself, and recognizing that it is important, even if we do one-on-one, -on -one, small group, and congregationally, God never intended for us to be amongst ourselves. Now, what he did say, two can become one. Or he did say it's not good that you be alone. Or he did show that when he made the animals, he made them two by two. He made them male and female. It was God's design that we inter integrate together, we uh, participate together. It's a part of God's plans to carry forth his message. Now, as we transfer uh, over to this third topic, this third topic deals a little bit more with what we call instructing or instruction. So today we want to talk about how not being indifferent and not being an individual, how through instruction you can do what God has asked the church to do. Now, what has he asked the church to do? Well, first of all, the church is to be a bullhorn, all right, a megaphone uh, to announce something. And here's the reason why. Today, I was listening to a news article where they were talking about the national anthem. And this representative was sharing that he feels as though legislation should be passed in his state, Wisconsin, that requires uh, sporting, major sporting events to have the national anthem song. He gave his reason, and this is where it shows why it's important for the church to be what God designed. His reason was because these major sporting uh, owners have benefited from tax dollars. They've gotten low interest loans or they've gotten tax reduction uh, so that they can build these stadiums. And he says, because you use tax money, we can legislate what you do. And his assembly passed that law overwhelmingly requiring that you participate in hearing or reciting, singing the national anthem. This is nothing but a view into what God has already told us about the last days. So ultimately, the church is here to be a bullhorn for the last days. Listen, it is important for us to understand we're living in Bible time where what God said would happen is taking place. You remember when the Bible made it clear in the Old Testament that there will come a time when right will be called wrong and wrong will be called right or evil will be called good and good will be called evil? Well, we are in those days. Cheney lost her position because she told the truth. She lost her leadership because she told the truth. The Bible says because they rather believe a lie. We're living in that time, 
and of all the times to suggest that we don't come together to show love with, for each other and spur each other on, indifferent to each other, and that we will be individuals who go on our road, then we are missing what God designed for the church. We are mouthpiece. We're bullhorn. We're megaphone. We must proclaim the truth so that people will at least have a choice when it comes to a lie. If we can tell the truth the way they are telling a lie, I believe we would have gone home a long time ago. If we could proclaim the truth the way that they proclaimed the lie, then we would turn around and this gospel of the kingdom will have been preached unto all the world, and then shall the end come. But you know what? God didn't leave us out there. He didn't just let us guess on what to do. He gave us some clear instruction as we deconstruct the church. God intended for the church to not be shut down. There's a bridge in Memphis. I'm from Memphis originally, and I found out that there's a bridge that goes between Memphis and Arkansas that has been shut down. It has been shut down because they found a crack in the foundation. I'm here to tell you, maybe there's a crack in our foundation and, and, and the pandemic has discovered that crack. And therefore now we shut down because we are no longer the bridge between life and death, between heaven and hell, between salvation and damnation, because there's a crack. Well, I'm here to tell you that crack has been repaired. If we go to the word of God, he can weld that crack back together as we come together, assemble to carry forth what God has designed the church to be. So let's go there. You want instruction? I'll give it to you. But it starts out with this. When we examine the world around us today, it seems as though there, that there's uh, no harmony, just nothing but disharmony and tension, more so than ever. Racially, economically, politically, we have nothing but disharmony. However, when we consider how Christ operated, it was seen that we are living in a period of time when Christ's method is needed more desperately than ever. I pastored for a long time, and I can tell you, I struggled for years trying to create new ways to find that I can reach people, new ideas, new catches, new hooks. I, I just needed to find something that will work. And, 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 and new stuff will come out. Somebody will create this new thing and that new thing. And, and, and I still struggled with seeing results. But I discovered a statement. And this statement is something that has just permeated with me ever since I read it. And it's found in the Ministry of Healing, page 143, to 142. And it says this, Christ's method alone will give true success. Now, if I read that statement to you and I told you it will give you true success, basically stating a guarantee. If I told you this was about gambling, you know, that if you went his method, you are guaranteed to win. You bet on him. You bet on this. You're guaranteed to win. You would probably be willing to try to give me money so that you can make more money. But this is not referring to money. Look at what it's referring to. Christ's method alone will bring true success in reaching people. Now, I'm not against creativity or all of these things. But something tells me that Christ has a little insight method-wise on how to reach people. So I appreciate all the great authors who have this and all the great trainers who have that. But I think it's worth taking a look to be instructed by the instructor in terms of methods on reaching people. So to you today who are listening, 
I want you to understand we're living in the last days. We are the bullhorn. We are the megaphone. We are the microphone for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but it is for reaching people. And he has a method that he has employed and demonstrated that I want to challenge everyone, whether you are a pastor or you are a worker in the church or what they call a lay person who's not holding a position, you can do and utilize Christ's method and have success. It says the Savior did some things that we're going to look at. I'm just going to read through it and then we will examine it. It says he mingled with men, but he mingled as one who desired their good. He showed them sympathy. He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. And then he said, follow me. But it doesn't stop there. It says how he did it. He had an accomp accomp uh, something accompanied him. He was accompanied by power of persuasion. He was accompanied by power of prayer, by the power of love. And then this is the guarantee. This is what you can take home to the bank. It says, those things that we read, this work will not, cannot be without success, without fruit. That's a guarantee. I have read all kinds of books. I have looked at all kinds of methods, but I've never had one that made a guarantee. Because if you make a guarantee and I do it and it doesn't work, I can sue you. Well, sue Christ, but you'll never win because if you use his method, it is guaranteed to bring success, but only in reaching people. And so, no, we will not be indifferent. We will assemble together two by two. We will assemble together in small groups. We will assemble together as a congregation, but for the purpose of reaching people. And if you want to be successful in two by two, in small groups, or as a congregation, then follow these instructions. It is important for us to know that there is a way that we can win, build, and sin. See, as we go through these methods, the goal, I want to say the goal, it reminds me of when this soccer game was going on. I remember this guy turned around and hit this goal. Uh, he was over in one of these country, uh, another country, and when he hit that goal, man, he hollered, goal! And he went on and on and on and on because a goal was scored. Well, you got to look at what's your goal, even if we do Christ's method. What's the goal? Why are we doing it? And I'm here to tell you, if you ever wanted to do something significant with your life, you will not find a more significant goal than to win, build, and sin. The goal is for you to win others, to build others, and send others. It's the will, bend, and sin. That's ultimately what our goal is as a church. We can find ways to do it, but ultimately the goal is to win, to build, and to sin. That's what the goal is. And you and I must understand this as we take a look at Christ's method alone. Christ's method alone alone. I can stand on this. You can take this to the bank. It will not bounce. It will be cash. His method alone will bring true success. So let's start with the first step he made. Now this right here is probably going to shock you because unfortunately in our environment often we are a society unto ourselves. We eat amongst ourselves. We talk amongst ourselves. We fellowship amongst ourselves. And no wonder why there's nothing outside of ourselves. But it says the first thing Christ did was mingled. He mingled with men. He mingled. He associated with them. He circulated. He, he, he turned around and socialized. He mixed with them. He blended with them. He moved around them. He was not an isolationist. He was not a separatist. He was one who recognized 
that he was sent into the world that the world might be saved. And notice I said the world. I did not say the church. I did not say the sanctuary. I said the world. And here's the thing you and I must understand. When he made that statement, that includes you and me. He wasn't talking about uh, the world in the sense of, well, you know, I got, I got the kingdom of God and I have the world. No, God so loved everybody, everybody, that he gave his only begotten son. And the reason why I know it's the world, because he said, of that world, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. So he didn't die for believers. He died for the world so that people can become believers. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He mingled with people in the world. And now this is the catch. Do you know that there are people who may not, who are not Christians, we call them of the world, but he also mingled with worldly people in the church. See, it depends on how you define the world. The world is defined as people who do not love him. For God so loved the world, the who do not believe in him. God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now, belief requires action. It's not belief in word. It's in word and deed. Okay? It's, 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 it's like you turn around and, and, and ask somebody if they believe you. You know, this guy asks uh, this, this guy to get in his wheelbarrow as he walk across uh, Niagara Falls on a rope. Before that, he said... Do you all believe I can do it? The crowd cheered. Yay, we believe you can do it. He said, okay, then one of you get in the wheelbarrow. Nobody got in the wheelbarrow. Belief is action. So whosoever believeth in me, meaning that they demonstrate it by the way they live, by the way they give, by the way they talk, by the way they walk. And when I say walk, I'm not talking about here, take away your smooth stride, you know, you, you come from a certain uh, angle. You know, he didn't take away Obama's stride because he became a uh, president. He was just a smooth brother as a president. What it means is, are you following in his footsteps? So he mingled with the world, inside the church and outside the church. Because sometimes what we can do, you know we can dismiss people in the church. If we don't like you, even the way we treat you, if you fall. You see, if you were to turn around and go to jail and you were not a member of the church, I would go to jail, I would minister you, I bring you back into, I bring you into the church, I would baptize you, and that day you can become a deacon or an usher or whatever you want to be. But if you happen to be a deacon or an usher or a preacher who falls and you come back later and say you want to give your heart to God and be restored, we say you can, but we have to basically put you on probation. We can't just put you back in. It's because we have this misnomer, this disconnection that worldly people uh, are both in the church and out of the church, and we're supposed to love them the way that God loved them and not have this distinction. He mingled with that. That's why he went to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. How can he save them if he doesn't go to them? How can any be converted if he dismissed them, if he ignored them? They had just as great a need as the leper did. And that's why he mingled. And so you got to mingle in church and out of church. And that's why it's sad when the only people we often mingle with in church is our small group, the group that we know versus mingling with others who could benefit from our mingling. But our goal is to win, to build, and sin. And so now we look at the instruction, which it starts out by mingling. You can't win anybody if you don't go amongst them. Imagine me winning my wife telepathically. You know, I'm just going to think it. I'm going I'm, I'm to wish that she know that she knows how she knows that I feel about her. No, brother. I mingled with that woman. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I did some mingling. We, we, we got together. I took her around my family. 
I spent time with her. I took her around people I respected so I could get their opinion. I mingled with her. I, I called her on the phone, and then um, I would drive to her two hours away and then drive back. When it first started, I actually, she would come visit me. I would ride back with her, stay with a friend so I could mingle with her. Then I'd get on a bus and catch a bus back home. We mingled. We mingled so much to the point where I felt I couldn't go without mingling with her. So I asked her to marry me in October um, uh, to be my girl. In December, we got engaged. In February, we mingled for life. Because mingling, you can't win her without mingling. And then he goes on a little further, and he explains to us that he showed sympathy. He showed sympathy. When we looked at the way this police brutality stuff goes, it appears as though there's no sympathy. Stop you for any reason, and then progressively raise the temperature by pushing you and asking you questions that have nothing to do with why they stop you. Stop you because you had an air freshener in the window. Okay, then give me a ticket. Hey, do you smoke marijuana? No. Have you ever smoked it? What does that have to do with you stopping me? Uh, do you have a marijuana card? You, you, you see, it just pushes you. That's not sympathy. And, and, and unfortunately, we can be that way with church, see homeless people and turn our nose up. And I'm here to tell you, even if a homeless person is out there and you think it's a scam, it takes a whole lot to stand outside for 10 hours a day begging. Something is wrong. <laughs> you might be running a scheme or a scam, but Lord, if you can stand out there 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours on a corner, I'm going to believe something is wrong emotionally or even mentally, but it's not going to cause me to turn up my nose. So what I've taught my children and what we do is we literally pray. We look for impression as to whether or not this person or that person may be someone we help but we never turn our nose up. You see, because I came from a poor background. I know what it was like for my grandmother to stand over the kitchen sink washing dishes and crying because she wasn't quite sure what she was going to have for food for her children plus us. I know what it feels like. So there's a lot of sympathy that goes because I can identify sympathy and empathy. Uh, sympathy more so because I just feel it in my heart for humanity. Empathy because I've experienced it. So he let them see his sympathy. It was no mystery that God, through Jesus Christ, was a sympathetic God. And you and I must understand that Jesus understands our weakness. Although he was always God, he became completely man. And daily he knew the same kind of problems and difficulties that we have. So he sympathized with us. you got to sympathize with people. Now you may say, well, I, I can't sympathize. I've never been poor. Yeah, but you've been human. At least I hope you are. And you've experienced pain and heartache and sadness and sickness. It doesn't matter. Rich people die. Rich people get disease. Rich people uh, uh, lose income. It's not a matter of you, you have to experience exactly what someone experiences, but you have experienced humanity. And so he sympathized. There were people who refused to take more than they needed when offered more of what they had because they were in community. You know what that means? He ministered to their needs. He met their needs. That meant he understood what their needs were. Often we try to help people as churches, and we don't even know what the need is. We try to give somebody a blanket who needs a basket. We try to give somebody a toothpaste who need a dentist. We, we don't even necessarily meet people's needs. 
And this is what is important. You, you can't know my need if you don't talk to me, if you don't mingle with me, if you don't sympathize with me. You can't know my need. Yes, let's look at me today. You'll look back and say, oh, you don't look hungry. I'll never forget, I went to the welfare place while I was in school to go get food stamps. And I went dressed like I'm dressed now. I was in college at Oakwood, had a briefcase, went down there to apply for food stamps. I walked up to the lady and said, hey, where, where do I go to apply for food stamps? And the lady looked at me and said, you don't look like you need food stamps. And I looked at her and said, let me ask you a question. What does hungry look like? In other words, I'm supposed to come in there, my clothes hanging off, shirt tail out and, and come here, yeah, hey, can you tell me? I got to look like I need it. And I'm sitting there going, see, it's because she don't know me. It's not a look, it's knowledge. And had she known me, she would have known that I was a student who could not afford to live on campus. So I lived off campus and I lived in a house and my dad had to send me money to pay for the rent. But I had to find a way to eat. I worked on campus, but that went towards my bill. I couldn't afford to go in the cafeteria. So then someone made me aware, do you know that as a student, because you work and you don't make that much, you qualify for food stamps. So how am I supposed to look? And how is the needy supposed to look? That's why we assemble together, because there are people even in our church who have needs. Then that's why we go out. So he met their needs. That meant that he became aware of their needs. He recognized what they needed. And that's why even when he healed the person, I'll never forget one time he healed the man, and he told them, go and sin no more. He met his need. He healed them, but he let them know that your issue is your sin. I'm going to heal you, but you can't keep doing what you are doing. So meeting a need doesn't mean just supply that need and let it go. It is help people understand how not to go back there, how to be better, how to do better because we are meeting their needs. Now, he mingled. Now, he sympathized. Now, he met their needs. Now, watch this. Then he said, I won their confidence. So now they have confidence in him. They, 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 they have built a relationship where the, the needs were met and the heart is touched. And, and, and so you got to win their confidence. When I first started out um, as a, a non Seventh day Adventist, I had become a Christian in the Baptist church, but I'd gone through some traumatic uh, stuff that happened in my life. And it was at that point that God intersected me with a group that came and knocked on the door and started Bible studies with us. I've got to tell you, First thing they did was mingle with us. I never forget it was in the summertime. And they found out we were having a family reunion. I never forget the lead guy who led out in the study came to our reunion. He showed up at our reunion. Oh, we jammed at our reunion. Though he was a Seventh day Adventist Christian, he came to our reunion, our picnic. He came there. He, he was a part. He mingled with us. Then I was dealing with stuff, and my family dealt with some stuff, and he met our need. And then uh, he sympathized with us. I'm sorry, he sympathized with us. And then he, we had death in the family or something happened. He was there. Then he met our needs. And ultimately, he won our confidence. How much did he win our confidence? Do you know for six months, I never asked them what church they were from? Because he mingled, because he sympathized, because he met our needs, he won my confidence. So after six months, it dawned on me that nobody in my family had asked him, where are you from? And finally, I asked that question. And his response was, I'm from Longview Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church. And when he said that, I didn't even flinch. 
I was like, oh, okay. Now, why did I say that? Because whatever Longview Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church was, if it was based on him, then it was a good place. He won my confidence, and he gave me confidence that that was a church that I should be a part of. These are important things that you and I must understand. And once we've done those things, we can now make a move. We can now say, okay, it's time for you to be a part of my family. It's time for you to accept what you have learned. It's time for you to go all the way. This is how the progressive steps of Christ took place in his day. This is what God has given us as steps to help us along the way. He started by mingling, he met their needs, he showed sympathy, he ended up calling them to be disciples. When? When through mingling, when through sympathy, when through meeting needs, when through winning confidence, and then you can bid them to become a disciple. And what's a disciple? is a person who wins, who builds, who sins. It's a cycle. You win, you build, you sin. And so I want to share this scripture with you that uh, is vitally important to help you understand exactly two scriptures as we close out. The first one says in Ephesians, let me go there, chapter 2, verses 7 through 10 in the Message Bible. It says, God has us where he wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. So he says, the time that Paul is dealing with is a time where God has us just where he wants them, showering grace and kindness upon them. Now, this is almost a setup because he's doing what we said in Hebrews. He's saying, I've torn the curtain. You now can come boldly to me, and you can come with confidence. But he doesn't do that without a hook, and that's where this is. He's showering grace and kindness upon them, but for what reason? In Ephesians 2, verse 7 through 10, it goes on to say, what's really at center here is saving. Paul says saving is all his idea and all his work. So he's showering this on us to save us, but he also has another goal in mind. He says, all we do is trust him enough to let him do it. So we trust him enough to let him save us. It's God's gift from start to finish. Then he goes on and says, we don't play the major role. Because if we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we did this whole thing. I saved him. I saved her. They are here because of me. He says, no. You neither make nor save yourselves. So you don't save yourself. You did nothing that saved you. It was God's doing. It says God does both the making and the saving. And then here's where it goes. So if he does the making and the saving, he saves you. He says he creates each of us by Christ Jesus. This is why he saves us. To join him in the work he does. So that's why I presented to you his method. If he's asking you to join him in his work, what is his work? How does he work? And then it goes on and says, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do. Work, and this is where it hits, we had better be doing. So you and I must understand that this salvation thing is about us being saved to save. It's not about us being saved to, to live saved, to be happy and saved and glad and saved and rejoice and saved. It is, I have saved you 
so that you can become a part of my workforce, work that I've already gotten ready for you. This is important. And that's why I shared his method, because we are to be a part of his work. There are no unemployed Christians when it comes to the work of salvation, the work of saving others. He then goes on to say, for we are his workmanship. This is in the King James Version. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So ultimately, why did I give you instruction? I'm giving you work instruction. You are a workmanship. You are part of a workforce. In order for you to work the work, then you need to heed the instruction. It says, he mingled with men. Yes, he started out by mingling. He showed them sympathy. He met their needs. He won their confidence. And then he said, I want you to become what I am to do what I do. So this is the original intent of the church. I challenge you at Rubido, Maine, and Rubido Moreno Valley, and Rubido Nation to do the work. Be the work. Now, if you want to say to God, employ me, then will you put it in the chat that I want to be employed by God. Just say, employ me, employ me. And then you can put it down below. Employ me, employ me. This is one area where you don't have to be unemployed. Employ me, God. Let me be a part of your workforce. Put it in. Employ me. Let us pray. Let me, Father, we thank you that you have demonstrated to us how to work the work. You've given us instruction, God, that will help us win, build, and send. You've set that example. We gather together. We come together as a workforce, two by two, in small groups, and as we gather as a congregation, so that we will be charged up and instructed on being a part of God's workforce. Thank you for the instruction. Now let us do likewise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.